Amen. It's been so long since I've been here on a Sunday, I feel a little bit like a guest speaker. But uh, turn to somebody and say, Happy New Year. Because, you know, this is the head of this next week will be the head of the biblical Hebraic year, 5784, as you heard from Rabbi. And I want to just speak for a few minutes today on possessing the double doors of hope. Amen. How many believe that that hope is a great word? Amen. And so um, this is coming into to the Hebraic year. For those of you that aren't familiar with this, we are on. We live our lives on a Roman calendar, a Gregorian calendar, and we're in the year 2023. How many figured out we're in 2023? Because it's September now. You should know that, okay? Um, but in the Hebraic year, we're coming in. I think it's on Friday. I think that starts or Thursday that starts 5784. And the, they always look at the eight, the last two digits, the eight and the four. So the eight or the 80 is um, the word in Hebrew. It's the word pay. Everybody say pay. And pay indicates your mouth. Everybody touch your mouth. Okay. It talks about mouth, voice, and sound. How many understand the, the things that you say are important? The sound that you make is important. Amen. The voice that God has given to you is important. And I believe that we're in a season right now where so many things are in a place that God is listening for a sound that comes out of us. Do you understand that there is a heart-mouth connection? Do you realize you can't even be born again without opening your mouth? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. How many know that believing in your heart is not good enough? You've actually got to open your mouth and make a confession. Amen? And so let me just say this. I believe in this season that we're in right now is that our mouth is activating things in the spirit that would not be activated otherwise. The, the scripture in Deuteronomy 30 says, the word of faith is nigh you, even in your heart and in your mouth, that you may do it. All right? So we have to understand that God is paying attention to what's coming out of our mouth, that our mouth is activating things. And then the four is the word door or gate or, if you will, portal. And so, if you will, we are coming into a time of voice-activated doors. How many know that we have motion-activated doors, that we walk up to the doors and the doors open? How many have ever walked up to an automatic door and it didn't open? How many broke your nose when that happened? Okay, it's a rude awakening. Well, the, during this season, it's not just about motion activation. It's about voice activation. We live in a voice-activated society. We have, we have these devices that you can speak to and they talk back to you. I don't have Alexa in my house because I just feel like that's too invasive. But we have our phones, so how many know they're listening to us anyway? We, we're in a day that everybody is listening. If you don't believe it, talk about something and then pull up your Facebook feed. Come on, we were in, we were in Nashville one time, and we were, um, I was helping somebody that had come with us. Their suitcase got damaged, and we were standing in a store, and I said, so tell me, tell me what you're looking for, and I'll help you look. Well, I'm looking for basically a, a smaller suitcase, hard case. If I, if I could possibly get one that's blue, that would be great. And, I, and while they were looking, I just opened up my phone, and there in my Facebook feed were blue hard case suitcases. Understand, things are listening to us, all right? But more than that, God is listening in the realm of the Spirit. I was, we were driving along in, in our car one day, and I was, I was speaking in tongues at the top of my voice, just praying in the Spirit at the top of my voice. And over on the floorboard of the car, out of my purse, Surrey says, I'm sorry, Jane, I don't understand what you're saying. I kept praying in tongues. She says, I'm sorry, I still don't understand what you're saying. I was waiting for her to break out into tongues and interpretation, okay? That didn't happen, but I'll let you know if it does. 
But we are living in a voice-activated society, and I believe that we're coming into a time of open doors. How many are believing God for some open doors? How many are believing God for greater things than what you've walked in in previous seasons? Well, I want you to know that Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. Just throw your hands up in the air right now and just thank Jesus that he is the door into the kingdom of God. Come on. We're doing a series right now in the kingdom of heaven. It's not just a, it's just not a gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, a gospel of an entire domain, and Jesus is saying, I'm the door into that domain. Amen? In Revelation, the Lord says this. He says, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. This is the season that we're coming into. How many understand God identifies himself as he who opens? Say, he who opens. Say that with me. He is the God that opens, and when he opens it, it cannot be shut. Amen? Now, one of the verses that the Lord has really put on my heart for this season comes out of Hosea chapter 2, verse 13. And I believe that this is really going to be something that will mark this next year ahead. How many feel, as you pray in the Spirit, how many can feel turmoil? I'm not trying to put that on you if you're not feeling it. Let me tell you, but there are, when you travel, when you go in and out of places, we were in um, Maui last week. And thank you, everybody, that, that sowed seed and that gave. We were able to, to bless the church in Maui as they're feeding the people that lost their lives, lost their property. Well, they're not feeding people that lost their lives. Y'all have to pray for me. I'm a little tired, okay, because they're really not feeding people that lost their lives. But they are feeding people that lost all their property, okay? And, and so many, there was so much grief, so much sorrow, so much disappointment, so much turmoil. But you know what? I really believe that this is such a powerful verse for them, but I believe it's for us in this upcoming year. Maui is actually called the Valley Island. And so this scripture, I think, was very important to them because when it says, I will make the Valley of Acor a door of hope. Everybody say hope. The Valley of Acor does not have a good history. It's a place where Achan stole from the Lord the things that were devoted to God, and as a result, Achan and his entire family came under judgment. But that valley of Achor, which Achor means the valley of trouble, the valley of disaster, the valley of calamity, the valley when you go through hard times, the valley of trial, the valley where you're challenged with situations, God says, I'm going to turn that valley of trouble into a door of hope. And I believe that this is a promise from the Lord in the midst of this, in the midst of this time. Because later on in Isaiah, Isaiah says that the Valley of Achor became a place where people brought their flocks to rest and to graze. How many believe that God can cause your valley of trouble or challenge or trial to become a resting place for you and a place where the peace of God overtakes you and the hope of God overtakes you, amen? Listen, we always want to talk about being on the mountaintop, but I'll tell you, it's in the valley that the fruit is grown. It's in the valley that character is produced. It's in the valley that God takes you to another level of your faith, and so God is going to turn the valley of Achor into a door of hope. But as I was praying, I really felt like the Lord said it's not just a door, but it is two doors. It is double doors in this season of time. So I want to read to you from Isaiah 45. And this is a verse that talks about Cyrus, who was a conqueror in ancient times. I've written a whole book about this. He was a conqueror in ancient times. He was a pagan ruler, somebody that didn't know the Lord initially, didn't even have a concept of the God of Israel. But he came in, and when he conquered Babylon, he came in, and one of the first things that he did is he was introduced to this prophecy that was written about him 150 years before he was born by name. 
think about this. God wrote about this man that would be the deliverer of Israel out of Babylonian captivity. And we're a prophetic house, but I want you to see this prophetic picture. 150 years before Cyrus was born, God said this about him. said, I'm going to raise you up. You're going to set captives free. You're going to restore the Jewish people to their homeland. You're going to give them money. You're going to give them wealth to go back and to rebuild their temple and to rebuild their city. Well, here, let me give you the, the part that blows your mind. Israel was only in Babylonian captivity. Judah was only in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. That means 80 years before they went into captivity, God was already prophesying the name of the man that would bring them out of captivity. Eighty years before the temple was destroyed, God was already prophesying about the man that would release the wealth, the finances, to rebuild it. Does that blow your mind? You know what that means for us today? That means that before you ever got yourself into the trouble that you're in, God already had a plan to get you out. Come on, that gives me so much hope. God said this about Cyrus, and I believe that we are living right now and we are coming into an even more pronounced Cyrus season. It says, thus says the Lord to his anointed. That is actually the word Messiah. Now, we know that Cyrus was not the Messiah. He was a type, a foreshadowing of the Messiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings. Come on, how many understand God's going to be shifting some things in nations in this season of time? To open before him the double doors. Everybody say, God is opening my double doors so that the gates will not be shut. God says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you, lift your hands up and receive this. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Lord, we decree in this season you are making our crooked places straight. God, if the enemy has risen up against us with bars of iron and gates of bronze, God, we decree right now that you are the breaker. You know how to break the bronze and the bars of iron. You know how to bring breakthrough, Father God, for those who have come under attack. We decree right now, God, that you're giving us weapons of war. That's what it means when it says that I'll give you the treasures of darkness. It literally means weapons of war. The Lord says, I'm giving you new weapons of war to stand, to fight, and to break through in your new season. The Lord says, and with that will come the treasures of darkness. With that will come the things that the enemy has robbed from you in this last season and is buried deep in the ground and told you you could never have it back. The Lord says, I am releasing not just the new weapons, but I'm releasing the bounty. I'm releasing the, the spoils of war. The Lord says it is that season, a Cyrus season for my people. Rise up, rejoice, know that you're crossing through so the double doors and entering into your new season, says the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a nice loud shout of praise. Whew. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So let's look at what these doors mean. My husband's going to, oh, he's going to open my water for me. Isn't that nice? He's such a sweet man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. First thing I want to talk about after that, the first thing. Y'all have to really pray for me because, bless you, uh, we, got, we got home last, late last night after preaching, and y'all know we've been on the go, and um, my husband took my iPad and put it on the, on the, front, the front row over here. And um, he said, you know, I, I put your iPad, you know, and I said, <laughs> on the front porch. I said, I don't even know where those words came from. So you're going to have to pray for me this morning, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's look at this. This is what I believe it's going to mean. Number one, that we are going to possess the door of the supernatural, 
Amen? I believe that if we're going to possess the door of hope, we've got to enter in to a supernatural mentality. I don't even have time to scratch the surface of all the supernatural things that take place in Scripture in a doorway. But I'm going to touch on just a few of them. First of all, in Genesis 18, when Abram and Sarah were old, it says Abram was in the door of his tent, the doorway of his tent, and the Lord came down and told him that he and his wife were going to have a baby. And you know what Sarah said? Sarah laughed. I would laugh. She was older than me. Matter of fact, I think when she had the baby, she was 89 years old. This is not a blessing I'm praying for. Yeah, his oldest bishop, that's right. And Abram was 99 years old. How many believe that from that doorway, God released something that was absolutely impossible that God brought out of the realm of impossibility into the realm of possibility? How many have something that God has spoken to you that is absolutely impossible? Come on, if, if, you, if you don't have something God has said that's impossible, I want you to begin to believe God to speak impossible things to you because this is a season of not just God speaking impossible things, but doing impossible things. Come on, we sang it today. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Come on, we've seen our own daughter raised from the dead this year. Come on, don't you tell me he can't do it. We see that the Red Sea was a place of impossibility. Come on. They were running away from Pharaoh's armies. They came up against the Red Sea, which stretched as far as you could see one way and as far as you could see the other way. Pharaoh's armies were coming down on them. How many understand that in the natural, they did not have any example of a previous miracle where God split a sea? <laughs> They did not go, hey, God, remember where you did that before for those people? Could you do that again for us? No, 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 no. They did not even have in their imagination the fact that God could open up a sea. And I'm telling you, the kind of miracles that God's going to do this year are miracles of biblical proportion. They are miracles that maybe we've never even heard of, we've never even seen of before. I'm telling you that we're coming into a season of time where God is saying, when it looks like the way is blocked, when it looks like your enemy is pursuing you, when it looks like there is no way possible for you to move forward, God is going to make a way where there does not seem to be a way. And God is going to do miracles for you for your family, for your finances, for your health. God is going to do supernatural miracles. And God is saying to us, I believe in this season, exactly what he said to them then. He said, the enemies you see today, come on, the enemies you see today, you are never going to see again. The enemies you see today, you are never going to see it again. If you believe that for yourself, I want you to throw your hands up in the air. Father, we just decree this right now, God, that you are bringing a line of demarcation. God, when the Red Sea closed up, God, there was no going back, but there was also no going forward for the enemy. And, Lord, we decree that there, this year is going to be a year of, of delineation, of demarcation, God, that we can't go back to an old way, to our old life, but, God, neither can the enemy pursue us into our future, God. We decree that now in Jesus' name. We see that the Shunammite stood in the doorway. Do you remember this story? I love this story. I could preach every week from this story. 2 Kings chapter 4. The prophet was coming through town on a regular basis. And he was such a blessing. The Shunammite came and said, I want to be a blessing to the prophet. So she built a room in her house for the prophet to stay. Listen, guys, there is a difference between just getting a prophetic word that blesses you, that comes and goes from your life. There's a difference between that mentality and a place where you build a room in your life for the voice of God. Come on, I don't want to just hear from God when a prophet comes into town. 
I want to I want to hear from God every day because the prophetic anointing rests upon my life and lives and dwells in me. Let me tell you this that this is a season that we must increase the size of our prophet chamber. We've got to increase the size of that place that we go to hear the voice of God. So she built a room in her house so that the prophet could come and dwell there. And the prophet said to his servant, you know, she's done so much for us. What, what can I do to bless her? And so the servant went and talked to her. And she said, you know, you know we're well off. We're financially good. Um, we've got influence in our city. There's not, not really much that we need. So thank you, but there's not really much that we need. Listen, if God comes to you and says, I want to bless you, please don't say no thank you. I know y'all better than that, okay? But the servant said to Elisha, you know, she doesn't have a son. Now understand this. In that culture and society, women were valued by the children they produced. But this woman had gone through grief for so many years, disappointment, month after month, year after year, come on, that it was no longer even at the forefront of her wish list. What dreams have died in your life? Because it took a long time to see them come to pass. Can we think about maybe things that God promised you 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? And can we pull them back up to the top of the wish list? Listen, Bishop Hammond received a prof received prophetic fulfillment, received a fulfillment of prophecy that was spoken over him at his ordination. He received the fulfillment of that in his 50th year of ministry. Now, how many of you are saying, yeah, I don't want to wait 50 years? But how many want to see every single promise that God has fulfilled, has promised you over your life come to pass? Let me tell you, you may have gone through highs, you may have gone through lows, you may have gone through crooked seasons, crooked places, you may have gone through seasons where you wondered, can God even use me? You may have gone through seasons where you wonder, maybe I've nullified the promises of God, but how many understand the promises of God are yea and amen? Amen? And so the, the prophet called the Shunammite woman. He said, go get the woman, and I want you to see what he said to her. He said, so he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. Here's the problem. Her husband's old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Everybody say, in the doorway. How many understand she was standing in the doorway of her miracle? She was standing in the doorway of the supernatural. And he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. <laughs> and she went, thank you, prophet. I'm so excited about this prophetic word. No, no, no. You know what she said? She said, don't mess with me. I've already gotten used to my grief. I've already gotten used to my disappointment. I've already let go of the dream. Prophet, don't mess with me. Come on, how many things have we forfeited because we've given up hope? Just lift your hands up. Father, right now, God, I thank you that you're stirring hope again. God, hope that that prodigal will come home. Hope that family members will be saved. Hope, Father God, that no matter how many times they may have failed in some business endeavors, God, that there is a new door of hope, Father God, that is bringing them in to the fulfillment of promise. God, hope, Father God, that there can be family restoration, marriage restoration, God, that there can be, Father God, they can come into a place of dynamic fulfillment, God, and they can embrace the promise the way that the Shunammite did. I want you just to just, just, re, just pull that down from heaven and receive it right now. Amen. I, I, I know that I'm going through a lot of examples right now, but I want you to have an expectation about this next year. 
Another great door that we talk about a lot around here is the gate beautiful, Acts chapter 3. And you know this story that the apostles were on their way to the, to the temple at the hour of prayer. This whole year is going to be marked by times of miraculous prayer, times of encountering God in prayer. They were on their way to encounter the Lord in prayer when they walked past a lame man who sat by the gate beautiful. Now, you got to think, this is in Jerusalem. Jesus had been in Jerusalem. you got to know that this guy had probably even seen Jesus walk by. But what did Jesus say? He said, greater things than I do, you're going to do. And this man was seated next to the gate beautiful. It doesn't just mean it was a beautiful gate, because in the Greek, this term beautiful actually means the right time, the right hour. It means a season of flourishing, a season of blooming. Now, we've been talking about super bloom around here. How many know that at the beginning of COVID, before COVID even happened, the Lord had given us a word of super bloom? We actually got it at Stephen Jenny Watson's church when Rachel Hicks was preaching there. And, and she talked to us about super bloom. And then God just began to unveil it to all of us. We began to decree that before COVID was even a thing. And during COVID in this church, and we're not a huge church, but we, I, think we had, I think we counted 42 families bought new homes during COVID. Every business, I think, exploded in business. People started new businesses that thrived in their very, very first months, very first year of business. They were in the profit. They were in, they were in the black the very first year. Come on. We had super bloom because God said, I will bring uh, blossoms out of the desert. And we laid hold of the word of the Lord, and we saw church growth. We saw business growth. We saw family members, prodigals come home because God said, it's the right hour. It's the right season. You need to war with the word of the Lord. And so at the gate beautiful, I want you to see this. The, the lame man that had sat there for years received a voice-activated miracle. They were walking by. He was begging alms, and he was crying out for money. And Peter and John turned and looked at him, and they said to the man, look at me. And then they made this decree, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that decree activated healing in this man. And it says, and they took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his ankle, his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he leaped up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Come on, we see that the dead were raised in the city. We see that the doors of the prison were opened when Paul and Silas began to praise. Come on, the doors were a place of the supernatural. I want you to stand to your feet with me, and we're going to make this decree right now. Come on, if you've been in prison, if you've been depressed, if you've, been, if you've had mental anxiety, if you've had physical sickness, if you've had uh, addiction, if you've had hopelessness, I'm telling you we're in a season right now. God is saying speak and make decrees and act. Activate your miracles. Activate miracles for your prodigals. Activate miracles for your businesses. Activate miracles for your family. Come on, I'm telling you that you may have felt like you were in a stranglehold. God is decreeing this is a season of breakthrough for you. Lift up your hands and decree this with me. Say it with me. Thank you, Lord, that you are revealing yourself as he who opens and no man can shut. 5784 is the right time, the appointed time for my miracle. I am standing in the doorway of the supernatural and hearing God's voice of promise. I let go of all past disappointment, barrenness, shame, and fear and embrace my divine opportunities. I activate my miracle season with my voice and I make a choice to believe God in the face of impossibility. With God, all things are possible. I will possess my double door of hope this year in Jesus' name. And if you believe that, I want you to just give the Lord a big shout. Hallelujah. Woo. Amen. 
So we're going we're gonna to activate that double door, that supernatural. Number two, God is releasing to us in this season strength to turn the battle at the gate. Strength to turn the battle at the gate. Isaiah 28, verse 5 and 6 says, in that day, I want you to say, in this day. In this day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. For a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to turn for those who turn back the battle at the gate. That word strength means force, might, valor, victory, and strength. It also means to be a warrior, a champion, a strong man, to be brave and mighty. It means to be a giant. <laughs> I want you to lift your hands up. Come on, there's been a wearying in the last season, and the Lord is saying, I'm imparting new strength to my people. I'm imparting strength to, to turn the battle at the gate. I'm imparting strength to my people that are going to stand for justice. Come on, God is releasing justice in this season of time. That's where God deals with the corruption. That's where God makes the crooked places straight. That's where God comes down and intervenes in the course for men and for women. We decree right now, God, we are not backing up. God, as a matter of fact, we are rising up. I heard the Lord say this is a time to rise up and take risks, to rise up and take risks, to rise up and receive the strength of the Lord, to rise up and to be a warrior, to rise up and to be a champion, to rise up and take the mantle of strength and bravery and boldness and risk-taking upon our lives so that we can begin to fight the giants, Lord, that have been possessing the gates, Lord. You said that we would possess the gates of our enemy, God, and we decree that now in Jesus. Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it says that there is a great and effectual door that's open to me. How many believe that that's God's opening some doors this year? That's kind of the good news and the bad news. You know, it's like the pastor that said, we've got a huge hole in our sanctuary roof. It's going to take $50,000 to, to, to fix the, the hole. He says, but wait, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. He said, the good news is we already have all the money that we need to fix the hole. And everybody went, yay. He said, but the bad news is, it's in your pockets. Okay? So we got good news and we got bad news. The good news is there's this huge gate that's open to us of opportunity. But it says, and there are many adversaries. And there are many adversaries. So I want to remind you of Hosea chapter 2, verse 13. That says, he will give you the valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, the valley of calamity, disaster, the things that the enemy wants to stir up, I will give that to you as a door of hope. And as I was studying this a, a number of weeks ago, I heard the Lord say, this is going to be a year of victory in the valley. Victory in the valley. We've been talking about Psalms 23 that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We've been talking about that. And we've been talking about the, you know, how God will sustain us no matter what we're going through. How many have found that his grace is sufficient for us? Amen. Now, let me just say, we just came back from Hawaii. And um, many of you know that um, my husband tries to kill me when we go to Hawaii because he decides that somehow along the way that I am a master hiker. I am not. I am not a hiker girl, okay? But every time we go to Hawaii, my husband's like, let's go hiking. I mean, we're going to bring our hiking shoes, and we're going to hike the beauty of Hawaii. And so I just want to show you two paths that we've hiked. This is not me, but it's really not me, okay? But on the left is Cocoa Head. How many have ever been to Hawaii? Cocoa Head is basically straight up. And we were just driving by one day, and my husband goes, hey, let's go hike that mountain. It's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, as hot as blazes, and no water. And he goes, let's go hike up that mountain. So we took off, and I finally, I just said to him, you just go on. I'll come at my own pace. I did not look like this. My husband was not allowed to take pictures of me because I did not look my best, okay? 
He tried to kill me, I'm, I promise you, okay? Um, and then over here, this interesting windy path, that is the top of Diamond Head. And I did not show you the steep stairs that you, I don't even know how many stairs there are, but I am not hiker girl. So I begged him, I said, please, honey, can we please do an easy hike? Can we hike in a valley instead of on a mountain? So the next year, he took me to a place called Manoa Valley. Now, this was about 15 years ago. If you go there today, you'll be like, what's your problem? Because they've cleared out all the paths and made it really super easy. But 15 years ago, it was a pretty, pretty tough little valley hike. I mean, it was much easier than this. But it was a, a, a tough valley hike. And I learned some lessons of hiking in a valley. Let me just describe this for you. You hike back through these tropical forests that look like Jurassic Park. I mean, you've got these fern leaves that are, and I mean, massive. It just looks like something out of a prehistoric age. And you hike back to a waterfall, and then you turn around and you walk back. Well, on the day that we decided to hike this valley, um, we were, it was probably about 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was supposed to be 45 minutes to an hour in to the, the waterfall and then back. Now, we knew that the sun wasn't going down till about 7.30 or 8.00. And so we thought, oh, we've got plenty of time. And so we hiked up to the waterfall. We took pictures. We took our shoes off, put our feet in the water. It was, it was wonderful. And then we started walking back. Now, let me just describe for you walking in this valley because you had to walk over tree roots and lots of rocks. And there were rocks that would fall off, the, off of a wall over here. And then there was this deep ravine that fell down about 30 feet. So, I mean, if you didn't watch where you were walking, it could be actually quite dangerous. And it had rained, so it was very muddy and very slippery which wasn't really a problem hiking in. But hiking back, I learned my first lesson about hiking in a valley. And we're living in a valley season, so I want you to hear these lessons. Number one, it gets dark in the valley much quicker than it does on a beach. Darkness fell in that valley so quickly that it was probably only 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and I could not see my hand in front of my face. I mean, it was that dark. Now, I described to you the treacherous trail that we were going to have to walk, and I could not see my hand in front of my face. I certainly couldn't see where my feet were walking. So my husband was like, come on, babe, we got to go. We got we to get out of here. And I'm like, I can't see where I'm going. And he said, honey, come on, we got to go. We, we got to get out of here. And I'm like, why? Can we just spend the night here? I mean, this is dangerous. I mean, this is scary. And he's like, yeah, we got to go. So I learned my second lesson is that when darkness falls very quickly, it will slow you down or it will stop you in your forward progress if you're not careful. And so I was, I was literally paralyzed by fear of walking in the valley. How many understand the valleys sometimes can present things that are unknown? My unknown was where my next foot was going to take me, where my next footstep was going to take me. It was pretty scary, and we were moving very, very slow. But then, everybody say, but then, we got a revelation. We had iPhones in our back, pocket, back pockets. Now, I will tell you the sad truth of it is that at the time, our iPhones were way outdated, and we only had pitiful little iPhone 4s or 5s that did not have a built-in flashlight. So we were like, oh, we've got iPhones, and then we pulled it up, and there's no flashlight. So you know what we did? Standing there in the darkness, standing there in the valley, we downloaded a flashlight app. Listen, when you're walking through darkness, sometimes what you got to do is throw your hands in the air and start downloading revelation from heaven because God said, my word will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And we downloaded a flashlight app, which I have to say was pitiful. It was a tiny little pinprick of light out of each of our phones. But then we learned the next lesson in the valley, and that is this. A little tiny bit of light drives out a whole lot of darkness. 
Come on, a little tiny. You might feel like you only have a little tiny light, this little light of mine. I'm telling you, if you let it shine, it'll begin to prepare a pathway before you that even though darkness is encroaching all around you, God will give you a pathway to be able to walk through that valley place in victory, in safety, and in advancement. And so let me tell you, we started moving. Now, we weren't moving fast because it was just a little light. We started moving down the path, and I started becoming convinced that we weren't going to have to spend the night there. When all of a sudden, everybody say, all of a sudden. Say, suddenly. How many love God suddenlies? I swear to you, this really happened. Out of nowhere, in the woods, out of the bamboo, came these two Hawaiian, maybe angels, they had flashlights strapped to their forehead, and they were booking down the path, and they come up to us and they said, looks like you could use a little help. So they each reached into their backpack and pulled out these huge flashlights, handed them to each of us, and took off down the path. Seriously, it really happened. And we stood there looking at each other like, did that really happen? And we had these huge flashlights, and we began to advance. How many know that God knows how to bring you angelic interaction? Come on. God knows how to send angels. I don't know if they were really angels, but I'm telling you they had flashlights with them, so we didn't really care. God will send angels to interact with you, to intercept you on your path, and they will provide a download of light and revelation and ability and divine strength to get you down the path to get you where you need to go. Amen? Lift your hands up, Father. We just decree right now, God, that you are giving us victory in our valley. God, you are going to give us every bit of revelation that we need. You're going to give us every bit of joy that we need. God, you're going to give us every bit of vision that we need, God. And Lord, you've anointed us that when darkness covers the earth and deep darkness covers the people, that the glory of the Lord is rising in us, God, dispelling the darkness, shining your light. And God, you said that when that happens, that the nations will come to our light. So Father, we decree right now, God, that no matter what darkness encroaches in the, in the earth in this next season of time, God, we are going to shine the light of your love, the light of your truth, the light of your revelation that's going to penetrate and break through the darkness, God, and help us to advance no matter what's going on in the earth. And God, that you are going to be glorified so that nations will come to you in the midst of that time. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, clap your hands. Amen. So we did go back to Manoa Valley this year, and it was much easier. Not because I'm much better, but they cleared the path, okay? You can put the next screen up. I just want to show you some famous battles in valleys. We have Exodus 17, the Valley of Rephidim. That's when Israel confronted the Amalekites, the robbers. And God took them from robbery to recovery. How many believe God's bringing you out of a season where the enemy's robbed from you and bringing you into divine recovery? David fought Goliath in the Valley of Elah. Goliath's name literally means to strip you bare and to take you captive. God is breaking us out. David learned in that battle. You know what he learned? He learned to go from intimidation to determination. You know what he learned to do? He learned to prophesy to the enemy. <laughs> We prophesy to each other. We prophesy to the lost. We prophesy. But you know what? This season, we're going to learn how to prophesy to the enemy. You know why? Because the enemy has been prophesying to you. He's been trying to put fear in your heart. He's tried to put doubt in your heart. He's tried to put anxiety on your soul. He's tried to mess with your mind. He's been prophesying doom, gloom, and destruction. And you know what? That's what Goliath did. When David came out against him, he was like, who is this pipsqueak of a little boy? Listen to his prophecy. He said, it says he cursed him, he cursed David by his gods. But I want to remind you, we cannot be cursed because the shout of a king is in our midst, amen? He cursed him by his gods, and then he said, today I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air. You know what that is? That's a prophecy. That's the devil saying, I'm going to kill you. I've heard the devil tell me he's going to kill me, and I'm still here. Come on. I've heard, him, I've heard literally audible voices of the devil threatening me. How many, have ever, who, how many have ever heard the devil threaten you in an audible voice? And you know what? The whole, his whole thing there is to intimidate us. 
to get us to sit down, shut up, and back up. Don't you dare. That was Goliath's plan with David. Let me intimidate him. You know what David did? He rose up and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? You come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts whom you have defied. This day I'm going to take your head from you and I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air that all the nations will know that there is a God in Israel. I am telling you, you might be in the fight of your life, but God is saying if you'll start prophesying to your enemy, he's going to rise up and he's going to show off in a magnificent way and he's going to take down your Goliath. So I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is, well, the bad news is you're going to have to fight giants. The good news is you eat giants for your bread. The good news is you are a warrior. You are a champion. The good news is you are also a giant. Say, I am a giant. We see Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones, I don't need to preach that to y'all. The Valley of Jehoshaphat. I love this story. Jehoshaphat's surrounded by his enemy. Valley of impossibility. We know the story. He sent praisers out first. And after God caused confusion to come into the camp of the enemy, hear me. As we praise the Lord, as we're giving honor to God, what we have to understand is that God is being glorified. But as we're saying, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. You know what God did? God caused a spirit of confusion to come down in the camp of the enemy, and they turned on each other. I want you to understand, that's going to happen this next year. We're going to see the people of God glorifying God, and then we're going to see the enemy fall into confusion and start destroying each other. And after that, they went into the Valley of Barakah, which is, which is the Valley of Blessing. How many believe that God could bring you out of just battling into a place of blessing? Amen? Let me say it this way. Battling to survive into battling to possess. How many understand that it's a different mentality? It's a different frame of mind. If you're just battling to survive, you're going to get worn out, worn down, and want to give up. But if you're battling to possess, if you're battling to take the land, if you're battling to advance, it's a whole different mentality. We're going through that door, and we're going into a season of battling to possess. Now, two more valleys I want to tell you about is a valley that is known as, as Hebron. Hebron is in a valley. Before it was Hebron, it was called Kiriath Arba. Kiriath Arba. You know what it means? Think about this for this next year. It means the city of the four. How many know we're coming into the, the year four, the year of the door? But it literally means the city of the four. For what? <laughs> for giants. Four, not just giants, four tribes of giants. But if you remember, when they went in to spy out the land, there were two men that brought back the good report, Caleb and Joshua. And Moses promised Caleb that he would give him Hebron. He would give him Kiriath Arba later on. And let me just read this to you. It's not on the screen, but let me read this to you. It says, this is what Caleb says to Joshua, he says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever. How many understand that the battles we're fighting today are not just for us. They're for our children and for our children's children. Amen. We are fighting a generational battle right now. He said this is going to be for your children and for your children's children forever. And now, because you have wholly followed the Lord. And now, everybody say now. 
Behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. That word strong also means a force. Listen to what he was saying. He was saying, I was a force to be reckoned with then, and I'm as much of a force to be reckoned with now. Come on, some of you that feel like you're getting up in age, I'm telling you, you've got wisdom behind you, and you've got a Caleb anointing upon you. Come on. Here I am this day, 85 years. I'm as strong now as I was then, and I'm as strong now for war, both in going out and coming in. I am a force to be reckoned with. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim, the giants, were there. And that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me. And I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, to this day. Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. And the land had rest from war. I think it's interesting that years ago, um, <laughs> we were doing intercession up in our prayer room, and Martha Lucia was the head. John Lucia's back there. Everybody wave at John. Martha Lucia was our head intercessor, and she was staring at the map of South Walton one day, south of the bay, south of the intercoastal, and she turned it on its side and found that it mirrored the map of Israel. Isn't that interesting? South Walton, south of the bay, mirrors Israel. And she turned it on its side and she said, well, where is, where is CI located? Where is Vision Church located? And she looked at it, and if you were to draw a dot on the map that was overlaying, we sit right at Hebron. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because we're a company of giant killers. We're a company of giant killers. So it says that he took Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. I don't have time to preach a whole message on this, but let me just say this, is that every one of those names indicates things that we're going to have to fight in this next season. Arba was the daddy of all of them. His name means four. His son was Anak, which means a strangling chain of bondage. I'm telling you, if you're under some kind of bondage, if you're under some kind of addiction, some kind of destructive p habit pattern, if you're under a, the crushing weight of anxiety and fear, I'm telling you that this year God is decreeing that if you'll put your trust in him and wholly follow after him, he's going to break the strangling chains off of your neck and bring you into freedom and bring you into life. Some of you feel like you've been cursed. I'm telling you, you are not cursed. The curse is being turned to a blessing for you. Talmai means a furrow or a rut, and it literally means to be stuck in a rut. You know what this is? This is the dream stealer. He wants to get you in a rut that gets you hopeless and helpless and discouraged and fearful and, and, and no active faith in your life because you don't believe God will come through for you. It's a spirit of religion. That's right. The enemy is a dream stealer. Shishai is the number six. It's related to the number six, which is the number of man. Listen, God's going to also deal with self. <laughs> we want to just talk about the devil. We don't want to talk about us. Self and pride. And as I've said here many times before, I am so much more afraid of myself than I am of the devil. Because it's me, myself, my pride that gets me out of alignment with God. How many give God permission to deal with self? Yeah, like only half of you raised your hand, so God bless you all. How many give God permission to deal with self, okay? <laughs> and Aheman is the brother of fortune. It's a spirit of robbery. I don't have time to preach on this, but let me just say, God's going to deal with these things. These, these came out of the valley that later became Hebron. I want to talk about one more valley, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. There's an important valley in the New Testament, the Kidron Valley, which is where you find the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is where Jesus 
prayed before he went to the cross. It was every bit as much a battle in that garden, in that valley, as it was in the other valleys that I've mentioned. How many know Jesus had to deal with self? He's tempted in all manners that we that all manner that we've been tempted, and yet without sin. This is where Jesus said, Father, if it if it could be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus battled for our breakthrough, for our salvation, for our victory. He carried our grief. He bore our sorrows in a valley. How many believe God wants to give us victory in a valley? How many believe that God wants to say, you know what, I'm going to supernaturally empower you to take out giants, but I'm also going to supernaturally encourage you and empower you to get through the hard places? How many figured out that even as a believer you go through hard places? That's why God wants to give you the valley of Achor for the door of hope. Let's stand up and let's, let's just activate this supernatural strength as we're getting ready to, to wrap this up. I want you to lift your hands up and decree this with me. Say, I am a force to be reckoned with. I am a warrior. I am brave and mighty. I am a giant and will take out giants. God will give me victory in every valley and turn trouble and calamity into a door of hope for me. This will be a turnaround year of justice for me, my city, and my nation. I break the power of every assignment of robbery, bondage, religion, and pride, and I take back every dream stolen from me. In the name of my mighty warrior, Jesus Christ, and if you believe that, I want you to give the Lord a big shout of praise. Hallelujah. If you don't mind, just remain standing, and I'm just going to give you this third, this third aspect that I believe is going to be important is that I believe it's going to be a time of encountering heaven in the midst of our earth realm. See, when I was five years old, and I didn't know Jesus, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in church, you all know my testimony. I went into my room grieving over the loss of a little boy that I played with in my neighborhood who had died. And I got down on my knees like I'd seen other spiritual people do on TV. I <laughs> didn't really know how to pray. I got down on my knees and I folded my hands like I saw them do. And I began to talk to God about the grief that I was feeling. And the presence of God came down in that room. And the Lord wrapped himself around me and just held me. And I encountered the presence of God before I had any paradigm or understanding of what was happening. And it felt so good I just kept coming back night after night, month after month, year after year, throughout my entire childhood, being in the presence of a God that I didn't even know who he was. I didn't get saved till I was 14. So from 5 to 14, <laughs> I enjoyed the presence of a God that I didn't even understand until I understood that Jesus became my Savior. I got saved at 14 and filled with the Holy Spirit at 16. Heaven came down and changed my life. I want you to understand this is going to be a year that we must encounter the Lord on a new level. Not just when we come together in worship. Do you realize that God would come down and Moses would stand in the door of the tent, the door of the tabernacle, and God would come down and visit him there. God would come down and, and manifest his glory. Doors became a place in Scripture of encounter. The door was the place that the blood was placed so that the, the death angel would pass over. I believe that when we pray the prayer and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're going to experience heaven manifestation. We're going to see the angels ascending and descending. Genesis 28 is when, when Jacob had an encounter with God where he saw the angels in, of God ascending and descending. And he had an encounter with God that changed his life and he said, how awesome is this place? He said, this is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Can that be said about this house? That we are a house of God and a gate of heaven. 
can this be said about your house? That we are, that you have a house of God dedicated to God and that there is a gate of heaven opened over you. Come on, God wants to open up the heavens over your life. Isaiah 45 verse 8 says, Open up, O heavens, and pour out righteousness. Let the earth open wide so salvation and righteousness can sprout up together. Come on, I am no longer satisfied to just talk about an open heaven until we start seeing the earth respond in opening up. So I want you to say this with me. I want you to say, open heaven, open earth. Open heaven, open earth. Open heaven. Open earth. This is where revival will come from. This is where awakening will come from. This is where our prodigals will return home. This is where we will see transformation begin to take place in our land. Deuteronomy 28, 11 is a scripture I read earlier that God is going to open the doors of his sky vaults and pour out rain on our land on schedule and bless us. You know, Revelation chapter 4, if you don't mind just standing for just one more minute. Revelation chapter 4 starts out by saying, I saw a door opened in heaven. That's in the Bible. John the Revelator saw it. And behind that door, he saw the throne, the throne of God. Years ago, we had somebody that came to this church that was praying for her 96-year-old father who was on his deathbed. And he was a hateful, hostile atheist. And he was dying in great pain and cursing God. And she was brokenhearted knowing that he was going to be in hell in a few days. Y'all realize that's the reality. Hell is not a made-up place. It's a real place. And she said, I don't even know what to do. And I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray that the Lord speaks to him in a dream or in a vision. How many know sometimes we have not because we ask not? And she called me a couple days later and she said, she said, he had this dream. And he's telling me about this dream that he had where he saw two doors. He saw a door and on the other side of the door, there was light and beauty and colors. And there was a second door. And behind it was dark and death. And she said, and he's terrified right now. I said, I want you to open up your Bible and read to him. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I saw a door opened in heaven. And I want you to let him know that that dream and that vision that he just had is an invitation from Jesus to, to give his life to him. Even at the end of his days, it doesn't matter what he's done, it doesn't matter what he's said, that God will forgive him and bring him through the open door in heaven. How many believe that's the truth? I want you to know she opened up the Bible and she read to him and she described and he said, that's exactly what I saw. I saw colors and I saw beauty behind that door, but I didn't think I could have it because of all the horror things that I'd said about God. And she said, Dad, that's Jesus' invitation to say, I want you to come through this door. He prayed a prayer of salvation. He wept like a baby. And several hours later, he died and left this world. And he walked through that door into the realm of glory. I want us to lift up our hands all over this place. Father, we decree right now, God, that this is going to be a year of open doors. It's going to be a year of divine encounters. It's going to be a year of victory in the valley. God, and Lord, that we are coming in to a brand new season, Father God, Lord, where we can dream bigger. God, we can war with our prophecies. We can activate our faith. We can see resolution of long-standing issues, God. Lord, we can see, Lord, out of those places of supernatural encounters, God, Lord, that we are changed. And I want to encourage you. It took me going into my room and shutting the door and waiting on God for the presence to come. Right now as you're standing here, I can sense the presence of the Lord. And I want you to know he wants to, to make your heart new in this season. He wants to open your eyes. He wants to open your ears. But most of all, he wants to open your heart. 
so that you can encounter him in a brand new way. See, Christianity was never just supposed to be about rules and regulation and philosophy and doctrine. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. voice activated. Your breakthrough is voice activated. Your encounter with God is voice activated. Your new season is voice activated. The doors that God has set before you are voice activated doors. Faith in your heart coming out of your mouth, bringing transformation. Let's say this together. This will be a year of encountering the reality of God's kingdom for me. I will possess my door of hope and see heaven's glory and God's presence manifested in brand new ways. I will see heaven opened over my life and over my family. My eyes will be opened. My ears will be opened. And my heart will be opened to know God more in 5784. I will dream bigger this year. I will rise up and risk knowing God has gone before me to throw open the doors of his sky vaults for me. I will go through my door of miracles in 5784 in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I bless the people of God. And Lord, we look forward with great anticipation and expectation for all that you have for us in our new season. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. We're going to have prayer teams down front. We invite you to come and, and let people pray for you, let people minister to you. If you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, please don't leave until you get filled up with the Holy Ghost and get your prayer language. If you gave your heart to Jesus earlier in the service, we invite you to come in and uh, come down and to talk with somebody, pray with somebody, and get some instruction. Give some people some hugs. Love on them. Love on one another. Introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know. God bless you. Have a blessed, blessed day. Amen.